ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय Shrimad Bhagavad Gita as it is, translation and commentary by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, Chapter 13, Text 22. Is translation required? Purushaf Prakriti Stohi Purushaf Prakriti Stohi Bhunte Prakriti Jangunan Bhunte Prakriti Jangunan Karanam Guna Sangosya Karanam Guna Sangosya Sada Sadyo Nijan Masu Sada Sadyo Nijan Masu It's verses written neatly, clearly. Just one thing, the apostrophe before the last word on the third line shouldn't be so far away from the letter S. It doesn't look like it has any connection with it. It doesn't make any difference to pronunciation. It just indicates that the first letter of the word Asya has been, has been dropped. Translation, the living entity in material nature Thus follows the ways of life, enjoying the three modes of nature. This is due to his association with that material nature. Thus, he meets with good and evil among various species. Purport, this verse is very important for an understanding of how the living entity transmigrates from one body to another. It is explained in the second chapter that the living entity is transmigrating from one body to another just as one changes dress. This change of dress is due to his attachment to material existence. As long as he is captivated by this false manifestation, he has to continue transmigrating from one body to another. Due to his desire to lord it over material nature, he is put into such undesirable circumstances. Under the influence of material desire, The entity is born sometimes as a demigod, sometimes as a man, sometimes as a beast, as a bird, as a worm, as an aquatic, as a saintly man, as a bug. This is going on. And in all cases, the living entity thinks himself to be the master of his circumstances, yet he is under the influence of material nature. Mm. How he is put into such different bodies is explained here. It is due to association with, with the different modes of nature. One has to rise, therefore, above the three material modes and become situated in the transcendental position. That is called Krishna consciousness. Unless one is situated in Krishna consciousness, his material consciousness will oblige him to transfer from one body to another because he has material desires since time time immemorial. But he has to change that conception. That change can be affected only by hearing from authoritative sources. The best example is here. Arjuna is hearing the signs of God from Krishna. The living entity, if he submits to this hearing process, will lose his long-cherished desire to dominate material nature and gradually and proportionately, as he reduces his long desire to dominate, he comes to enjoy spiritual happiness. In a Vedic mantra it is said that as, (coughs) as he becomes... Learned in association with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he proportionately relishes his eternal blissful life. Having read the verse from Bhagavad Gita, I'd now like to speak about Glenn Hoddle. Who has heard of Glenn Hoddle? None of you ever heard of Glenn Hoddle. Well, uh, some years ago, He was a nationally known figure in England, a household name, you could say, and was probably known to many, his name was well known to many people, at least in Europe. His position in British society 
in the view of many was second only uh, to that of the Prime Minister. He was the manager of the England football team. So you may wonder, why are we talking about the manager of the England football team in a Bhagavad Gita class or anywhere for that matter? Why should devotees speak about that? Well, his name appeared, uh, a discussion of him appeared in Back to Godhead magazine in 1999. And that may just remove the question one step further. What on earth was Back to Godhead magazine doing discussing Glenn Hoddle? Well, they weren't so much discussing him as a certain statement he made, which is connected with uh, one of the major teachings of Bhagavad Gita, surprisingly enough. Uh, it was, re was reported in Back to Godhead magazine in 1999 that Sri Glenn Hoddle uh, had had an interview with a journalist about football. But at the end, the journalist very slyly had slipped in a question about Glenn Hoddle's belief in reincarnation. It was known that Glenn Hoddle believed in reincarnation. So the, the reporter asked him, well, do you think that you know, people who, for instance, uh, physically handicapped people, or in simple English, spastics, is it because they're suffering? Are they suffering because of something they did in a previous life? And Glenn explained, he said, yeah, he said, it's not just the spastics, it's everyone. You get, and he quoted uh, from the Bible, you sow what, or you sow what you, you reap what you sow. So the reporter got what he wanted. He was, <laughs> He, he wanted to get something like this and he made this the focus of his, this point he made the focus of his report he can kind of seems like he tricked Glenn Hoddle and very soon the whole of the country was against him there was a massive outcry that how could he be how could he make such statements the papers were saying he's gone mad and it was because it was considered extremely cruel. You see, spastics are objects of pity. It's not, you know, they're just born like that. It's just their bad luck. And why do you see, you see then, many of them are very nice people. They didn't do any harm to anyone. It's just bad luck, right? And, and to say that they are the cause of their own misfortune is so cruel on the part of Glenn Hoddle. It caused an outcry, and notwithstanding his capabilities, I don't, I don't know what kind of a manager he was, but uh, he wouldn't have been sacked from the post, he, he was, but he was forced to resign under the outcry. So, uh, <coughs> surprising, actually, that someone... Is an ex-footballer. I think when I was a kid, he was a he was a footballer. He's, I, I kind of remember his name or something. Played for Tottenham Hotspur. Some of the useful, useless things stuck in my memory. Um, it's kind of surprising, you might think, that people connected with football have any interest in such uh, philosophic topics. You don't expect footballers to be very philosophical. As one devotee told me he met with a German football team or something. He was distributing books. He came across and said, a bunch of stupid guys. You don't expect people who kick a ball around for a living to be very thoughtful. I suppose they have to head the ball each time and I guess each time that, that diminishes their uh, meager stock of brain cells. Uh, of course, other people in the entertainment industry, as it's called, a very broad category, uh, have been uh, influential in promoting 
a general belief in reincarnation in the Western world. A few days ago I said that it was the distribution of Srila Prabhupada's books that was uh, largely influential in the increasing belief in reincarnation. But someone could channel, challenge that because I believe even before Prabhupada came to the West there were some fairly popular books in English which after all is the dominant world language. Uh, books of about some books about Buddhism had been translated or written by one Christopher Isherwood and there was a, there was a famous book about Zen Buddhism written by I can't remember his name now but when it was before Prabhupada published or came to the West because he was well known and they gave Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita for review to him Alan Watts that's the name Alan Watts uh, I read that book as a kid. It was about Buddhism, specifically about Zen. And uh, when Alan Watts was given this book, Bhagavad Gita as it is to review, he became very angry because he's a demon. He believes in reincarnation, but he's a demon. Buddhist, so it's a demoniac theory. And uh, so there have been other books. Lob Sang Rampa, is he translated into Croatian? Yes. Populous. All these stories about the. Tibetan lamas, which was found to be just uh, completely uh, made up, actually. Was, but he wrote it as if it was some factual experience. And the first massive hit paperback in history was about Shangri-La, some, I see, some place where it was a novel about some people, they crash in the Himalayas, and some Western people in a plane crash, and then they they meet the Tibetans and all that. So they've been there are, through books and then uh, more recently the Zen of motorcycle maintenance. and then, So through various books and uh, movies have featured reincarnation and years ago. There must be many, many more, but years ago in Rishinghananda Prabhu, our God brother at ISKCON Television in Los Angeles made a made a movie showing how reincarnation is featured in the movies. But that's this was a long time ago. There must be many, many more since then. Uh, I remember there was one clip. It was a comedy, uh, and one man in a bar was explaining to another about reincarnation. He said, that, "See if you do good works." you get born in an elevated state. And the man says, oh yeah, yeah, like Colorado, right? Because <laughs> Colorado, the the physical elevation is high. And there was a uh, lot of featuring, there was a whole movie about, made about someone from a previous life and then they came back in the next life and something like that. I can't remember. So anyway, Oh, yeah, I remember as a kid also watching on TV some program about someone just, some Tibetan guy just passing away and laughing as he passed away and all this. So, so I guess, uh, if it, it, it's not exactly the same as science fiction, which is just, well, that also has the effect of making people believe that, that such things as possible are possible and this science fiction idea of aliens invading Earth, which was way back in the 1930s or something, that was the uh, there was a, like a major crisis in America, a one-day crisis when they had a radio program about the aliens invading from Mars or something, and people thought it was real. Yes, 46. 46 was it just after the Second World War? People thought it was real. So, the, but uh, recently. Within this year, the most, uh, I guess, the most respected scientist in the world at the present time, Stephen Hawking, said, well, it's almost certain there are aliens out there. So it's become accepted science. But uh, there's a difference between that and reincarnation, uh, or belief in reincarnation. I'm just, I'm just comparing them because they're new concepts for the Western world and um, 
at one time considered bizarre. But there's a difference in that reincarnation is the accepted, uh, or it's the basis of a worldview accepted by a lot of people. Hindus, Jains, most, most Hindus believe in reincarnation. Jains, Buddhists, Sikhs, that's a lot of people. Uh, and there is there is uh, an ancient uh, body of literature and teachings discussing all this, and it's not just some some new lobsang rampa stories, but there are within the Puranas and Mahabharat and Buddhist literature, and there's the uh, and within there's a whole huge number of stories in India also which are based on the principle of reincarnation. We have, for instance, one out of thousands, this, this story in, within Mahabharata, the, the story of uh, Amba becoming Shikandi in her next, his or her next life, his and her next life, her and his next life. So, uh, yeah, there is a whole philosophical understanding behind it. Now, the outrage against Glenn Hoddle, if we analyze that a bit more, what, why, why are they so upset? They're, they're saying, well, the, the prevalent worldview is that, well, we only have one life and we just got it whatever we are. Either Christians, of whom there aren't that many in Britain today, they believe, well, God made you like that. Exactly why God would make someone like a, a spastic and someone else like a, some good-looking, healthy man or woman. They don't really think about that too much, it seems. Or the other, uh, it seems to be more prevalent worldview, although people don't really think about it philosophically, but they just kind of believe it without even thinking what they believe. They just go through life like animals, actually, most people, without even really thinking about what's going on. So the, uh, the, the prevalent worldview is, is based on Darwinism, which is uh, one of the many uh, strands of thought or genres of thought which comes under the demoniac worldview described by Lord Krishna Bhagavad Gita asatyam apratishtam te jagadahura nishwaram aparaspara sambhutam kimanyat kama haitukam this is a very important verse we have in the 16th chapter a description of the demons but this one in particular gives the the whole basis of why they're demons. And most of the chapter is about how nasty they are in various ways. But this verse describes what is their prevalent worldview. That there is no there is no ultimate truth, there is no underlying principle to anything, there is no God in control and you wanna have any philosophy? Well just enjoy yourself, that's all. That's that's the cause and meaning of everything. So it's it's uh, Darwinism means meaninglessness. There is there is no real meaning to life. There's just a bunch of chemicals, and they all got together, and uh, here we are, and we can manipulate the chemicals and make footballs and things like that, and enjoy ourselves, kicking around a football. Oh, there's so many other things. So it's, it's extremely shallow. Worldview. Um, you might ask, well, if everything if everything's meaningless, well, if there's if it's only just a bunch of chemicals, so why should you bother whether chemicals are in a spastic shape or any other shape? Or why should you worry about you worry about hurting the feelings of the spastics? Well, I didn't do anything wrong. I just got born like this. Uh, 
then why should you bother about their feelings anyway? Because that's also just a, another interact, meaningless interaction of chemicals. Of course, uh, Christians, they, they believe that, well, God made everything, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the good Lord made them all. Of course, he also made spastics. That's a bit of a problem. You don't, we, the hymns that we learned at school, we don't hear that all things perverted and perverse, all spastics and mentally retarded people, all the stool, it was all made by God. They don't sing hymns like that because they, they like to see the... Basically, they want to see this world as a place of enjoyment and if we're good, we'll go to heaven which will be more or less like here. Uh, the great uh, English theologian C.S. Lewis gave his description of England. Eh, it's just like Eng of, sorry, of heaven. Sorry, it's just like England. It must be, right? Maybe a little, little warmer and... Uh, Less rain. And the football team wins sometimes. <laughs> I don't think they had national football teams at the time. They didn't bother so much. I didn't bother. So, uh, we don't need this light on. Turn it off. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's also a very, uh, the, the idea that uh, God just made us, like, just, you know, God has a lottery or something. Okay, you have a beautiful body and you are a spastic. God, uh, Einstein didn't accept that idea. God said, I don't believe God is playing dice with the universe. Oh, I was going to talk about that point, entertainers, cinema. Uh, one also uh, major medium of promotion of the idea of reincarnation is uh, popular singers. I don't know, I've been out of touch with it for so long, but I presume there's, there are many popular singers. George Harrison, he believed in reincarnation. And some of his records were very influential, actually. All Things Must Pass, Living in the Material World, My Sweet Lord. I guess some of them, some of his songs must have addressed directly reincarnation. Um, it was known that he believed in that. So... These people have become influential. But uh, there's very few people with any clear idea of what's, what, how it actually works. Even the, even the Buddhists have a very hard time to explain reincarnation within Buddhist philosophy because for them there is, there is, no, there is nothing. There's no real existence of anything. So the idea of an atma, just as described in this verse, purusha prakriti stohi bhunte prakriti jan guna, that the atma is stuck in material nature and gets different sat, nice and asat, not so nice, like spastic bodies. The Buddhism can't accept that, so they have all kinds. Within, within a short time of Buddha's disappearance, because he didn't really talk very much about anything. I mean, his I mean, he did talk a lot, but he didn't really, didn't really give a very broad philosophy. Because if your philosophy is that there's nothing, everything, there is nothing anyway, or maybe that came later. But uh, I mean, basically, he was he was a moral teacher. He was trying to get people to be. He didn't really he didn't speak about God. He was say people don't, don't believe in God. He didn't speak about God, and so they were left with this whole thing of. All these people who didn't want to believe in the Vedas, but at the same time they had some kind of uh, belief system which was supposed to regulate their lives, and they had to fill in the gaps. And that's the, that's true with Christianity also and Islam. That after Christ, immediately Paul started filling in the filling in the so many teachings which were not given by Jesus. And you know, how much can one person give? Especially only in three years. And he wasn't systematically teaching anyone. And the same in Islam. They, 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 all the, the legal system and so many things came later. And, and it, it took a few hundred years in both the cases, in the case of both Islam and Christianity and 
Buddhism to make some something resembling a philosophical system. And there are various ones came out also. Whereas the Vedic literature, the Vedic culture is different because it didn't just didn't begin at any particular point in time and has from all the time it has a, a massive body in literature. It doesn't is not founded by any one particular person, but it has there just like Prabhupada came and taught, and it, it, even though he he didn't teach every single facet of of philosophy or how to live life, which is, you know, it's a huge, so many points, but he, he gave us the background. There's the Vedic literature and culture, Guru, Sadhu and Shastra. So just like, for instance, someone asked me the other day, is, is, it, is it sinful to feed toddlers grains on a Kadashi? Uh, as far as I know, no, Prabhupada didn't answer that question, but we have the answer because they're in Hari Bhakti Vilas, which is, again, redacted from various Vedic literatures. So we don't have that problem. Uh, Buddhism has a problem trying to explain reincarnation. Uh, one of their, or trying to explain anything for that matter. So one, uh, one theory in Buddhism, among the many schools, is that but the, the fact that there's, you see, a philosophical problem, if everything is nothing, then how is there any continuity? Remember yesterday morning? What were you doing yesterday morning? Can anyone say what we were doing yesterday morning? You're cleaning the yard, right? You're cleaning outside? Okay, well, if you're nothing and everything is nothing, how can there be any continuity between then and now that you can remember that you existed even? Or even to speak one sentence. If nothing exists, then the sound at the beginning of the sentence has no connection with that at the end. There's just nothing, nothing. So one Buddhist theory is that at every moment, everything is dissolved and then somehow or other it all comes back together again. And there's a sense of continuity, although actually there's nothing really there. It gets pretty bizarre. Uh, but, yeah, the Vedic literature, in Bhagavad Gita, I mean, in Bhagavad Gita, here we have one of the many verses which explains how this all takes place and why and how as others they 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 may have some belief in it but it's they don't really know anything and people in the western world it's such a such a pathetic situation that they th that they think that religious belief religious belief is there's just that belief I don't think we'll find anywhere except in Prabhupada's books about spiritual knowledge. They don't consider spiritual subjects to be knowledge. It's just what you believe. I, maybe you gave me one video I saw, a BBC production, about what does the world believe about God? And they had the, all these, they're interviewing all these people, including Imran Khan, who's a famous name, even now, although he retired from Cricket. He's not a football star. He's a cricket star. He was one of the greatest cricketers of all time, Pakistani. But he's a polit politician also. So he's still in the news now and then. So uh, he was there representing Islam. And then there, were, there was the bishop of Liverpool. And he was a Catholic bishop. And the topic of football came up in England. Any discussion, it's like, you know, there was someone talking about in the in the course of the discussion, though, it came up that David Beckham, I, I think even all of you down here have heard of, who's just like some ridiculously famous ex-footballer. Is he still playing? Maybe. Uh, they they rated him about forty percent of the people in Britain rated him higher than God, something like that. And then the Bishop of Liverpool said, "Well, we also we have our good football teams in Liverpool too, because well known that." Liverpool fans hate Manchester United fans who David Beckham played for and vice versa. Anyway, I'm just giving some insights into the triviality of it all. And there was uh, yeah, there were a group of people and they had interviews from all over the world going on and, and the compare gave each person about 29 and a half seconds to speak. And uh, What's your opinion? What's your opinion? And it just... Uh, 
such an important question and they're just taking people's opinions and giving them 20 seconds or so to speak. And what are the qualifications of the people to speak? I mean, a cricketer turned politician, he's a Muslim, okay, he believes in God, but but uh, how much has he studied anyway? They take it as such a trivial thing. I mean, uh, just taking different people's opinions and then just comparing their different opinions as if it's just some matter of opinion. It's such an such an important question, and they had atheists, of course, also. There. Such an important question, and they take it so trivially that you can just make some glib statements, and that's it, and then you'll understand more about God. But we find in Vedic literature... It's again and again mentioned here in Bhagavad Gita the word vigyana, the science of spiritual knowledge. But people just take it as some kind of belief or they take it as something so inscrutable that you can't even think about it. And uh, one nun on the show, she was on this BBC show, kept on saying, Oh, it's all just words, you can't understand with words. Yeah. It's then as if it's just something totally non-understandable, and then it, it just, and then you get the atheists who say, well, you know, they, they they think they've got a much more intelligent view of life because the the subject of God and the soul is so unintelligently presented that people who consider themselves intelligent, many people who consider them intelligent, think that this is just it's just childish. It's like as as one. Uh, as Richard Dawkins, who's maybe the second most respected, well, he's a f another famous English scientist. <laughs> he he repeatedly says that, well, belief in God, it's like believing in fairies or, and Santa Claus. It's just some kind of childish idea. Bhakti Charu Swami told me a few years ago, he was invited to an international conference on reincarnation in Switzerland. And the Dalai Lama was there, and a few, you know, some some people. But he said that he, he was the only one there who had anything coherent to say. They, uh, they, they just didn't, they quite, and he said that was quite obvious to everyone there. Because they didn't have anything tangible, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't know anything. All they, all they could say was that they, and they could talk about things like uh, this, uh, Ian Stevenson's, Dr. Ian Stevenson's experiments, which if people were actually open-minded scientists, they'd have to admit that there is that Dr. Ian Stevenson, who's now taken another body, he died a year or so ago, um, he had turned up enough evidence to uh, give a good... Uh, scientific background or, or to, to make a plausible case, a highly plausible case for the reality, that, that reincarnation is a reality. So they could state things like that, but how it works, how reincarnation goes on, and why it all goes on, and how it's being regulated, no idea. Buddhism, the philosophy of meaningless, it's self-defeating if you try to explain systems. There's systematic reincarnation. Why should that be? That, mean, that means if, if we accept karma, that someone is, as in the Buddhist stories, and uh, actually they take all, all their culture is taken from the Vedic cultures. <laughs> so... The, um, <laughs> then in Buddhism also it's believed that just as stated here, karnam guna sangosya sadhisadhyoni janmasu. Not quite as uh, clear as this, but they accept that if you do good deeds, you get good birth. If you do sinful activities, you get a sinful result. They believe in yamaraj and everything. In Thailand, prayom means Sri yamaraj. So, uh, but that means there's meaning. How does that meaning come? 
is there no no person who is who is regulating this system? Is there any? What's the ultimate goal of all this? And so, Buddhism, it's it's self, although they believe in reincarnation, it's a self defeating philosophy. Because even to try to explain any philosophy in Buddhism is immediately self defeating. If if there's everything is nothing and there's no meaning to anything. So in, in it's all absurd, and then you come to Zen Buddhism, which which thrives on absurdity, with such koans as they're called. Uh, koan means uh, like you know, that means it means like a meaningless saying, which you're supposed to meditate on. The most famous being the sound of meditate on the sound of one hand clapping, and then you you meditate on this and meditate on this, and when you fall asleep, someone comes and slaps you hard on the head. Or even if you don't fall asleep, even if your back isn't super straight, they come and smash you, and then uh, all of a sudden you ding the sound of one hand clapping, and you become self-realized. But you're not a self, so how can you become self-realized? So, and on and on and on. So, but yeah, so Bhagavad Gita gives scientific knowledge of this important principle. I mean, even in India, people have no idea. They just have some vague idea about reincarnation. And they're not even very sure about that. Uh, There's no systematic uh, dissemination of spiritual knowledge. So, uh, from the outcry against Glenn Hoddle, we can understand what a difficult job it is to educate these mudhas. They don't like the idea because the idea that they are responsible for their actions is frightening to them because they're so irresponsible in the way they live. It it seems that they're being nice. No, it shouldn't be bad to... To spastics, but they don't know what it means to be nice. Their 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 niceness, their so-called niceness, is based on ignorance, and no one no one can properly help others if they're in ignorance. Okay, that's why. That, that another instance is the passing away of this Mother Teresa, who I've said I've spoken about many times because it's it irks me that Mother Teresa is so much praised as a great saint when she was in an ignorant. Uh, meat-eating person who was uh, she's, she's who was trying to convert people from their uh, acceptance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to being meat-eating Christians. I mean, the Bengalis are mostly meat-eaters anyway, but that was her ultimate aim. And so, uh, yeah, like, it's like they think someone who's who's helping the body is a great saint, even if they're killing every day, eat, eating bodies that have been slaughtered. And they don't even want to listen to uh, any reasonable philosophy explaining how uh, the universe is not meaningless and that people are spastics. They got that because of some misdeed in... Uh, their immediate previous life, or maybe previous to that even. So, uh, it's not going to be so easy. But it is possible by, the dist- especially by the distribution of Srila Prabhupada's books. And, and we should teach these principles also. Srila Prabhupada went on teaching these principles. Because if people can't understand and accept this, then their life has to change. It seems that even many of our own devotees, supposed to be, they also don't really understand or accept this principle. Otherwise, they wouldn't live the way they are. We are concerned that devotees are promoting uh, all kinds of non-Krishna conscious modes of behavior and beliefs in the name of Krishna consciousness, or they say it's okay, it doesn't matter, but it, it just shows they don't really understand the purpose of life and the seriousness of it. They're not really convinced that we're not the body. 
They put so much uh, emphasis on the body and bodily enjoyment and, and being nice on the mundane platform. So, yeah, if, if this is systematically presented, then the religions based on ignorance, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, they also don't know about reincarnation. They, they have a vague belief in it. Buddhism, they're all based on ignorance, actually. So, when real knowledge is promoted, then uh, these glowworm-like religions will their influence will automatically diminish. Tesham aditya vajjjnam prakashyati param. Just like uh, when the sun rises, then everything can be seen. So when the sun of real knowledge arises, then people can see what is the actual situation. So these, as Srila Prabhupada said, within 50 years these cheating religions will be finished. He also said that this scientific cheating will be finished. So that will come about by distribution of Srila Prabhupada's books. I'm, Prabhupada was convinced of that. And, and it's not just some kind of uh, fanaticism on his part. The distributing these books will have a tremendous effect in altering the way that people view the world and then naturally their lifestyle will have to change also. People won't remain meat eaters if they know they're going to become slaughtered themselves in the next life. Actually, I, I, um, I've been thinking quite a bit about preaching among Muslims. We don't think much about that, do we? It's, it's a, I mean, Islam is a, is a major rising force in the world. Um, but books like The Higher Taste, maybe not exactly in that format, but maybe adjusted a little bit to different cultures, like in India. We should have that book in Tamil, a similar book, but it's adjusted to the circumstance. Well, first of all, the, the, but especially in Muslim countries, because... Um, well, many of the reasons that people become vegetarians, mostly not for spiritual reasons, but for um, health reasons. And there's plenty of evidence that meat eating is not good for health. So I feel if we, it's like a very, uh, what's the word, the uh, subversive way to enter Islamic society is to put some book like The Higher Taste, and give all the reasons, health reasons, this, that, and for health, many people would like to be vegetarians. But then give the religious reasons also, what we call and, and state your karma and this and that, and Bhagavad Gita. So many people, I, I feel this, as in, they, many may like to become vegetarians for health reasons, because in the modern world, I mean, people used to eat meat like once a week, once a month, at a, at some religious festivals, but now it's become daily. And some people, three it's quite common three times a day. In this country also, three times a day they eat meat. Uh, mm, it's quite common, if they can afford it. If they can afford it. Uh, and then, but the uh, the effect of, of ingesting so much toxic food day after day, and it's one reason why cancer is so common and other diseases. I mean, even apart from the toxins and of rotting meat and all the hormones, and but, but it's such high protein and difficult to digest protein. And on the whole, it's not good for the body at all. So many people know that in the West, and that's one major reason for becoming vegetarians. Um, but then, a lot. So many many people in Islamic. This is just some kind of theory I have. So. But uh, it, it's difficult to, to preach in those countries, no doubt. But you could, or, or in, the, or in those communities, the Muslim communities. But if that's introduced, uh, along with that, the concept of karma can be introduced. And actually, when people become vegetarians, and it becomes easier for them to understand these things. As long as they're meat eaters, they're grossly sinful, and they they can't even begin to understand these things. And that will also give them some idea that they're that there is uh, 
religious culture which when you become a vegetarian you can understand how much better it is than being a meat eater and when they see the whole Islamic culture is based on meat eating it's like an intrinsic part and there is spiritual philosophy apart from that then uh, I, I think it's, it's a very good way to uh, enter an otherwise very difficult field Okay, so there's a few thoughts on Karanam Guna Sangasya Sada Sadhyoni Janma. So the uh, how the how we get different bodies. That's described here. How the, how the spastics become spastics is described in this verse. So you may have thought, well, I said I was talking about some ex-football coach, but uh, it wasn't that age. It was just reading the verse and then just talking about whatever I wanted to talk about. But it, it is all connected. And it is interesting also, um, there's a, there a BTG article. A, uh, that Srila Prabhupada, he started back to Godhead with just this kind of article. He'd pick up something from the news and then comment on it on the light of Bhagavad Gita. So that's another thought. It's a very good way to preach that peop people are interested in the news. Not everyone, but many people are interested. Actually, everyone's interested in news. Not everyone's interested in the political news, but many people are interested in the sports news. Someone told me, was it in Croatia, there's a daily sports newspaper. You told me that. Just for sports. Uh, at least when I was a kid in England, they didn't have daily sports news, although in, in certain papers, about half the papers taken up by sport. This is going on for, you know, 40 years. For 40 years, they have a sports paper. No wonder... Sports kind of actually two. The two, the, the, it's two, sports, they two sport newspapers. One was, in, one was here in Zagreb. One was in Belgrade. Belgrade yeah. So, uh, yeah, you, I mean, it's pretty difficult to relate s sports issues. Uh, Spain won the World Cup football. Palavna and Maharaj. See, he's got nothing to. He's got no interest in it whatsoever. I can tell that for sure. I mean, apart from being an Iskon Sanyasi, he's from America. And in America, what do they care about soccer? But he knew all, of, of course, he, he knew all about it. You see, you just can't avoid it, right? It's just like all over. I stopped reading the newspaper because it was just all the World Cup. But I also found out because after it was over, I again opened the newspaper on the internet and it says something like Spanish heroes return home to tumultuous welcome or something and I understood they, they won the World Cup. So uh, it's pretty difficult to link all that to to uh, Krishna consciousness and it's pretty dull. But there are, well there are issues like there are issues there are many issues just like ecological issues uh, in America and Britain, many people are very, you know, they're not at all happy that their countries are sending, or they have troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, they're not happy with that. What right have we, and our men are getting killed, and we're paying for it, huge amounts they have to pay. And then there's the whole economic wind down that's going on. So there are many things that devotees can comment on in a way that can but with a completely different angle. Totally different. So that was one technique that Srila Prabhupada adopted for preaching. So there's a few thoughts on Glenn Hoddle and the problem of spastics. Why are there spastics? There can't be any God. If there was God, he would never have made spastics. No, there must be God. We believe in God. But he made everything. Why did they make spastics? Don't know. They have nothing else to say. We, we can we can give a different answer, better answer. Yeah. Any question, comment, or comment, please, or any uh, anyone want to join the? Chorus against Glenn Hoddle, who's now forgotten. Probably in England now, if you say Glenn Hoddle, they've probably forgotten him also. In 1999, he was the 
England, in the, he was the England soccer manager up to 1999 and probably completely forgotten now. Even the great David Beckham, probably in the last kids in 10 years' time, they've probably never heard of him. It'll be someone else. There's always someone else. Who's the next up and coming star? When I was a kid, let me know. The famous soccer stars, George Best, Bobby Charlton. Maybe they're known, I don't know. What is it? I remember we used to sell books, Prabhupada's book, the Krishna book, showing the name of George Harrison. Everyone knew him. It was great for selling the Krishna book in England. But uh, a few years ago, the devotee told me that if you say, that, that we used to start off our line when we met people, like, you've heard of George Harrison, haven't you? And of course they all say yes, because they all have and they all like him. So immediately you get a positive... You know, when you're selling books, you have to say question, give questions to them. They keep on saying yes, 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 yes. So when you say, well, take the book and give a donation, they also say yes. It's like they're in the mood of saying... But uh, one day what he told me, you asked the kids in England, this was like 10, 15 years ago, you heard of George Harrison, haven't you? Who? What? <laughs> That's the uh, that's the way the entertainment industry works. As long as you're entertaining, then you're. As long as you're active and you're popular, then you're known. And then after that, forgotten. That's all. And they they need ever new heroes. <laughs> we have a Nitya Navayamana. Krishna is always fresh. He doesn't grow old. He doesn't die. He doesn't. Uh, become unpopular, except among mentally retarded people. Yeah, so anything? Yes, please. In Christian's idea about spastics is even more bizarre because they say... Oh yeah, well, you know what the parents, they say. The parents are actually guilty. You know, the parents are guilty to have children like that. They did something wrong. So the Christians also believe in karma in this life. It doesn't all depend on your... It doesn't all depend... It's a... It doesn't all depend... It's in the What's that? So the family is condemned, you know, like the... The, the whole family is condemned. But, but you get good Catholics who give their money to the church every Sunday. Expl explanation I heard. And they also have spastic children. Then it's a test from God, like Job. <laughs> right? Yeah. Just to prove, you have in the Bible, just oh, to man. prove how, uh, how, what a great devotee Job is, then God gave him one trial after another. Yeah. Regarding this, then they come to the conclusion that because how we believe in God, that He created like this, so they conclude that God is there, but He doesn't care for this world. That's another theory. God is, He started the world, He doesn't really care about it that much, so... He just left it alone. He went no, off. To no, he cares, but Satan is there, and he. Satan is there. It's all Satan's he's work. He's kind of God's competitor. Another nonsense idea. God struggling with Satan is a really hard job, but in the end, he just manages to get on top of him. But in this world, Satan's having having a good time. Yeah, I mean, it's just all ridiculous. It's, it, I mean, it's not surprising that people become atheists. If this is presented as theism. It's a really, like, sad effect. Uh, I read recently, a few years ago, that they find some letters, some exchange between Mother Teresa and some bishop. Right, right. She Mother Teresa, she, she herself didn't... She, she was expressing so much doubt that God even exists. That was a private. She had like her counselor, and she confided to her counselor that she wasn't really sure whether God exists or not. And she's saying, after seeing, seeing that mess in Calcutta. <laughs> no, Calcutta always made me. I lived in Calcutta. I was in and out of Calcutta for years, and. Always gave me great faith in God. I mean, it's such such a chaos and how it goes on day after day. 
you think the whole thing would just sink into the... I mean, it's just totally chaotic, but somehow or other life goes on. So for me, Calcutta is a great proof of the existence of God. There must be someone up there who's holding it all together. Otherwise, it's, it's bizarre, you know. The telephone doesn't work. If you can get through, then the operators... You can get through to the operator, then you can't hear them, and then they, they're rude to you. And you know, it's, it's complete traffic jam, non-stop traffic. Then when there's rain, the whole city, everyone's just walking waist-deep in water. And, uh, things have improved since then. So many, so many bizarre things. Once, anyway, if you talk about Calcutta, you could go on for hours. There's so many things. Some, I remember seeing some, some guy just in, you know, dirty, covered in rags, lying flat on his back on the pavement with it, holding a puppy which was tied up to him and just like torturing the puppy, holding it up, making it rah, rah, scream, and then everyone's just walking past. No one cares at all, you know. Early in the morning, if you, and you go down to Bora Bazaar, you'll see these. Uh, Pygmies who have no hands and legs rolling to work. They get, they get into their begging spot before the crowds come. So many strange things. <laughs> so many strange things. Yeah. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. jai. Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jai. jai. Do you think Glenn Hoddle's worth a jai? He believes in reincarnation, I guess. It's a good start for him. 44 years later, <laughs> Alf Ramsey apologized. He's also must be dead by now. national team? Well, he wasn't, but he was quite famous. He was playing in the first league. In Italy? 
He was playing in Italy and then he came to Croatia. He's in the first league in Italy, that's... Anyway. I remember there was one uh, Liverpool football player who was doing a university degree while he was he was like 20 years old and he was doing a degree and playing for them. It was like big news, you know, a footballer getting a degree. <laughs> it's like because you just expect them to be stupid, right? Yeah. But in America, they have sports degrees. If you go to sport, you go to university just to do the sport. Mm. And you get a degree for, for being like, I don't know. They have this. Yeah. 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 We have also social. They, they, they call it university degree, at least. In, you don't get a degree for playing tennis or something. It's supposed to be something. Well, I guess you know, the brain is also used to some extent. It's not really intellectual, is it? Hare Krishna. Two, three days back, there was a kind of sensational news in Indian cricket. Some devotees sent a mail that India was about to lose the match, and this fellow was always uh, uh, played in crisis, and then he brought, uh, he, he, he made the Indian team win the match. And the post uh, in the interview, he said that. Sai Baba. <laughs> was it? <laughs> he said that. Uh, I mean, I always read Bhagavad Gita. And it became a sensation. So, Lord said, we have to go on and give Bhagavad Gita. So, Who is that? What was his name? His name is Vivius Lakshman. From South India? He's from Andhra. I don't know. Uh, it's not, it wouldn't be surprising if Bhagavad Gita was it is, because it's probably the most distributed. In Andhra, uh, Bhagavad Gita as it is and then there's some Sunda Chaitanya's Bhagavad Gita is very popular there also some Gita, Mayavadi Gita Press as well. Gita Press yeah I know so much in Andhra's how widely distributed this but many people read Sunda Chaitanya's Gita Maharandam in Andhra but definitely Prabhupada's Gita as it is is widely known in uh, this uh Ambani, who's the older brother? Mukesh Ambani, I think he's the older one. Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, he lavishes gifts. For his, for his wife, he gave her a jumbo jet or something as a birthday present. And then uh, they want, she, and she wanted to have an edition of Bhagavad Gita to give to all their friends, but they, they approached the BBT to publish like a super edition with gold binding just for the like, 1,000 copies or something. And then Bhima asked her that why this edition of Peter? He said, well, if you think of Peter, it has to be Bhagavad Gita as it is. <laughs> That's what she said. That's what Bhima told me. I remember seeing in the newspaper some, some big shot in Maharashtra was going to court and he was carrying his Bhagavad Gita as it is in the photo. We're out here. It's having its impact. Whatever, you know, all the problems in this school. It's like in Germany, uh, the, you know, the movement is such a mess. But then there's some devotees, they just, you know, like new devotees, a few years ago, they just decided, well, we'll just have our own little centers and distribute books. And they just didn't bother with, you know, GBC, okay, I know, have a good time. But they just didn't get involved in all that. Just went on distributing books and they're in bliss and they're making more devotees and you know, and it's still there's all this the, the, the main ISKCON is still, you know, all new age and weird and all this, but they just have their little centers and they do book distribution and they're in bliss. And it's in the long run that's what's gonna matter. As Prabhupada said in China, uh, that even he said just some are distribute books, if you can, even if you can't go there, that will have its effect. Apparently, Prabhupada said that even if all the devotees were to leave, as long as my books are there, it's okay. New people will come. So, the, maybe the best response to all the problems in this Croatia is just because you have to get the books first of all. <laughs> so that's one of the problems. <laughs> but uh, just, 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 just emphasize on this. It's like, the, it's like our Harinama book distribution. 
can't go wrong. Krishna will be pleased. Even if it's misinterpreted, misused, the funds are misused, this, that, and the other. The books are distributed, Krishna will be pleased. And that will have its effect. Okay, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Especially not like not in mainstream media, but maybe in alternative media, uh, there's quite a lot of talk of these uh, conspiracy theories. Is there what should the what is said? Like if someone's asking, like uh, our conspiracy I, theories? Yeah, sure. Like there's always someone trying to. People are doing this for uh, you know yeah. they are convincing, but they are polluting the air doing so many things, are they just in ignorance or they purposely do this? Do they it? may be purposely doing it. If they are, what are you going to do about it? And even if you remove one set of demons, you expose them, you remove them, what's to say another set won't come in? There's always someone trying to control. Someone's always controlling directly or indirectly. So what's the point? Just do our business. There's no use for us to try to, to remove them. It's just like, you know, your French Revolution, you throw out the king and then the mess became worse. You see here in Croatia also, I mean, under Dialu, the temple was, you know, there were complaints against him in Zagreb. They threw him out and, I mean, whatever he was, there was some, like, he was respected, he was holding everything together. And then I, since then, it's just been uh, chaos and a breakdown. Pritu in Ireland also. He, whatever properties, well, they got some recently. He did so much there, there were complaints against him, they threw him out, and then he's never been the same. I mean, for all his faults, he was, uh, he was a dynamic leader who, who got things done. And it's just gone down and down ever since. So, revolution isn't always the solution. It's easy to point out what's wrong, but, but uh, having done that, you have to get the thing right. Otherwise, you see, you see in the Kali world also, like they have revolutions and then they don't like the next leader and they, they throw him out also and it just goes on and on. I'm, I, I, regarding the situation in Croatia, I'm for change at the present point. I don't think we should keep these corrupt people in position. But the point is that it's not enough simply to tear the present leadership down, but you have to put competent people in. Sometimes a, a competent, corrupt person is better than an incompetent, honest person. I've seen that in, in, in Bangladesh. They, they, the, uh, when I was there, the uh, President Zia, he was shot. He was said to be corrupt. Yeah, well, corrupt. But then they brought in this completely ineffectual justice who people trusted to be a good man. And the country just became chaotic. At least when Zia was there, he was managing the economy and it was, it was some kind of law and order. But then afterwards, there was this weak person, well-intentioned weak person, like, like Jimmy Carter in America. He was well-intentioned, nice guy, but weak. And uh, he didn't serve America's interests as well. The leader needs to be strong. At the present time in Croatia, the leaders are neither strong nor giving any kind of proper direction. And they're corrupt. There's no advantage, certain leaders. There's no advantage to having them whatsoever. <laughs> All right, Hare Krishna. But Siddhartha says that Thakur uh, complained about some temple president who, like, takes two so He was money. corrupt, yeah, but Bhagavad yeah. said he's managing well. Yeah. And he, like, smashed the, the brahmacharis. And then... <coughs> 44 years later. <laughs> Alf Ramsey apologized. He's also must be dead by now. It's 44 years ago. Our Gopal Bhatta last year distributed, distributed some books to recently, I mean, also that period, you know, 1990s, I mean, was it 2000, 
there was a world soccer cup, there was a... Copa Alberta? Which Copa Alberta? You decide. Oh. Croatian, uh, he was a Croatian uh, player, and he was, uh, he was like the best player known in the world. In India, everybody knows about him. Really? Now Shuka. Shuka. So he distributed books to him. But to West Bengal, some remote village, and then offer him, I was shocked by the He's from a remote village, that guy? No, no, no. No, no. Go to West Bengal in a remote village. They know, they know. The guy approached me and said, Shukar. <laughs> you say you're from Croatia. Yeah, yeah, you say you're from Croatia. Oh, Davor Shukar. Or Goran Ivanishev, this tennis player. <laughs> so this Davor so Goko Vata said that this man was like complete, you know, like, you know, stupid, stupid guy. Red man, you know, just complete. I remember in Bangladesh, it was like, like, I don't know about in the villages, but like they were mad over Maradona. Yeah. Yeah. He's awesome. It's crazy. In Los Angeles, for years they were working the LAX airport. And about all the time, it's just very common, they'd meet celebrities, Hollywood celebrities. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, Film star, of course, film stars, rock stars. It was just like almost daily. No, no, yeah, no. Just, and politicians, all kinds of famous people, they'd give books to them if they could, because they all have bodyguards and they don't. They don't generally let you get close. Muhammad Ali was one. They gave him a book. And they had so many. The airport distribution. He met. Uh, but when it began, the airport book distribution was like the higher class of society. It's called the jet set. But, now, but then in America now, it's just normal. Everyone flies here. It's, if it's more than a... But still some people drive long distances. There's not any cheaper to, to drive. We had this... Uh, we had this... Right, right, he was a football player. Was he a Croatian national team? Well, he wasn't, but he was quite famous. He was playing in the, in the first league. In Italy? He was playing in Italy, and then he came to Croatia. He was in the first league in Italy? That's... Yeah, some joy. Anyway. <laughs> I remember there was one uh, Liverpool football player who was doing a university degree while he was he was like 20 years old and he was doing a degree and playing for them. It was like big news, you know, a footballer getting a degree. <laughs> it's like, because you just expect them to be stupid, right? Yeah. But in America, they have sports degrees. If you go to sport, you go to university just to do the sport. Mm. And you get a degree for, for being a, like, I don't know. They have this yeah. 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 They call it university degree, at least in oh, no. don't get a degree for playing tennis or something. It's supposed to be something. Well, I guess you know, the brain is also used to some extent in sports. Right? Yeah. It's not really intellectual, is it? Hare Krishna. Two, three days back, there was a kind of sensational news in Indian cricket team. Some devotee sent a mail that India was about to lose the match, and this fellow he was always uh, uh, played in crisis. And then he brought, uh, he, he, he made the Indian team win the match. And then, and the post uh, in the interview, he said that. Sai Baba. <laughs> was it? He said that, uh, I, I mean, I always read Bhagavad Gita. Who is that? What was his name? His name is Vivius Lakshman. From South India? He's from Andhra. I don't know. Uh, it's not, it wouldn't be surprising if Bhagavad Gita was it is, because it's far the most distributed. In Andhra, uh, Bhagavad Gita as it is, and then there's some Sunda Chaitanya's Bhagavad Gita is very popular there also. Some Mayavadi. Gita Press, yeah, I know so much in Andhra's, how are they distributed this? But many people read Sunda Chaitanya's Gita Maharandam in Andhra. But definitely Prabhupada's Gita as it is, is widely known in uh, this uh, Ambani, who's the older brother? Mukesh Ambani, I think he's the older one. 
So, uh, you know, he lavished his gifts at his, for his wife. He gave her a jumbo jet or something as a birthday present. And then uh, they want, she, and she wanted to have an edition of Bhagavad Gita to give to all their friends, but they, they approached the BBT to publish like a super edition with gold binding just for them, like 1,000 copies or something. And then Bhima asked her, that why this edition of Peter? He said, well, if you think of Peter, it has to be Bhagavad Gita as it is. <laughs> That's what she said. That's what Bhima told me. I remember seeing in the newspaper some, some big shot in Maharashtra was going to court and he was carrying his Bhagavad Gita as it is in the photo. For that edition. It's having its impact. Of course. Whatever, you know, all the problems in Iskon. It's like in Germany, uh, the, you know, the movement's such a mess. But then there's some devotees, they just, you know, like new devotees, a few years ago, they just decided, well, we'll just have our own little centers and distribute books. And they just didn't bother with, you know, the GBC, okay, I go, have a good time. But they just didn't get involved in all that. They just went on distributing books, and they're in bliss, and they're making more devotees, and, you know, and still there's all this... If the, the main ISKCON is still, you know, on New Age and weird and all this, but they just have their little centers and they do book distribution and bliss. And it's in the long run, that's what's going to matter. As Prabhupada said in China, uh, that even he said, just somehow the distribute books, if you can, even if you can't go there, that will have its effect. And apparently, Prabhupada said that even if all the devotees were to leave, as long as my books are there. It's okay. New people will come. So, the, maybe the best response to all the problems in this Croatia is just because you have to get the books first of all. <laughs> That's one of the problems. <laughs> but uh, just, 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 just emphasize on this. It's like, the, it's like our Harinama book distribution. It's our last resort. It's, 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 you can't go wrong. Krishna will be pleased. Even if it's misinterpreted, misused, the funds are misused, this, that, and the other. The books are distributed, Christian will be pleased, and that will have its effect. Okay, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Who's going to be the lecture? Yeah. Uh, like, uh, especially not, like, not in mainstream media, but maybe in alternative media. Uh, there's quite a lot of talk of these uh, conspiracy theories. Is there what should the what is said? Like if someone's asking, like uh, our conspiracy I, theories. Yeah, sure. Like there's the, always someone trying to. Demons are doing this for uh, you know. Yeah. They are convincing. But they are polluting the air and doing so many things. Are they just in ignorance, or they purposely do this? To they may be purposely doing it. If they are, what are you going to do about it? And even if you remove one set of demons. You expose them, you remove them. What's to say another set won't come in? There's always someone trying to control. Someone's always controlling directly or indirectly. So what's the point? Just do our business. There's no use for us to try to, to remove them. It's just like, you know, your French Revolution, you throw out the king and then the mess became worse. You see here in Croatia also, I mean, under Dialu, the temple was, you know, there were complaints against him in Zagreb. They threw him out and... I mean, whatever he was, there was some, like, he was respected, he was holding everything together. And then, I, since then, it's just been uh, chaos and a breakdown. Pritu in Ireland also. He, whatever properties, well, they got some recently. He, he did so much there, there were complaints against him. They threw him out, and then he's never been the same. I mean, for all his faults, he was, uh, he was a dynamic leader who, who got things done. And it's just gone down and down ever since. So, revolution isn't always the solution. It's easy to point out what's wrong, but but uh, having done that, you have to get the thing right. Otherwise, you you see in the Kali world also, like they have revolutions, and then they don't like the next leader, and they they throw him out also, and it just goes on and on. I'm I, I regarding the situation in Croatia, I'm for change at the present point. I don't think we should keep these corrupt people in position.
position. But the point is that it's not enough simply to tear the present leadership down, but you have to put competent people in. Sometimes a, a competent, corrupt person is better than an incompetent, honest person. I've seen that in in, in Bangladesh. They, they, the, uh, when I was there, the uh, President Zia, he was shot. He was said to be corrupt. Yeah, well, but then they brought in this completely ineffectual justice who people trusted to be a good man, and the country just became chaotic. At least when Zia was there, he was managing the economy and there was, there was some kind of law and order. But then afterwards, there was this weak person, well-intentioned weak person, like like Jimmy Carter in America. He was well-intentioned, nice guy, but weak. And uh, he didn't serve America's interests as well. The leader needs to be strong. At the present time in Croatia, the leaders are neither strong nor giving any kind of proper direction. And they're corrupt. There's no advantage, I certainly it is. There's no advantage to having it whatsoever. <laughs> All right, Hare Krishna. Siddhanta Sassar Thakur, the complaint about some temple president who like takes too so much.